I'd like to introduce Alison Kinnear with a topic, You Are Not a Fraud, Conquer Your Imposter, Your Inner Imposter. Alison is a mom, a coach, and an entrepreneur who is passionate about helping people turn down the volume on their inner critic and turn up the volume on their inner contender. She knows the journey from fraud to laughing and medicine well, well, and she has traveled and studied this terrain for the past 22 years. Allison is the founder and CEO of Voice Her Own, in which she coaches, speaks, and leads people to go from feeling not good enough to finding their voice, worth, and confidence. Please help me welcome Allison. Thank you so much. Um, I'm excited to be here. This is my first word camp, so I'm feeling yeah. good. Um, and I'm excited to bring this topic to you. It's funny, while I'm here, I'm seeing that there's all these amazing workshops about things related to my website and my business and technology, and this is not one of those talks. <laughs> this is a talk about you. This is a talk about your inner game. So I want to thank you for taking this time to come here today because we're going to be kind of diving deep into imposter syndrome, what it is, how it shows up in our lives, and what we can do about it. Um, but first, if I can just check, like, how many of you are bloggers or content creators? Will I raise a hand? Wonderful. How many are developers? Beautiful. And how many are, like, non-technical supporters of... WordPress. Excellent. Excellent. Perfect. That helps me. Um, I'm going to bring I'm, my notes are way over here, but I'm going to stand over here so I can move this. Um, so, my journey with imposter syndrome started a long time ago. I want to kind of tell you about that, and then we'll dive into what imposter syndrome looks like. Uh, in 2007, I was hired at Google uh, in their people ops department. And when I got the job, I had, was having a conversation with someone and she said, wow, you must be really good at what you do. You got hired at Google. And I said, ah, yeah, but if, if they really knew, this was someone close to me, I was like, I, I just feel like a total fraud. This was long before I even knew there was a term to describe this. And she said, what do you mean, a fraud? I said, I just, I feel like a total fraud. Like, if they only knew. I'm just really good at, like, convincing people that I know what I'm doing. Um, and apparently, I've, I've hoodwinked to everyone. And I coped with my imposter syndrome by doing all the things that, um, that a good imposter does. I was perfectionistic. I worked extremely long hours. I beat myself up over every little mistake that I made. And that worked for a, a bit. I mean, it helped me excel. It helped me do great things. But it also uh, was exhausting. And when I was, I started off at Google as an individual contributor, and then within a year I was promoted to a people manager running a team of 16 people. And at that point, that's when the wheels really came off the bus. Because I could no longer really be the perfectionist that I wanted to be. Um, it, my inner people pleaser that I had was really in conflict because when you're managing a team of 16 people, you can't really please everyone. My working hard and long hours really escalated, and I started getting feedback from people that was the, from my direct reports that were saying things like I was a micromanager, which really upset my people pleaser side. I was like, wait, how can I be a micromanager and a people pleaser? This is so confusing. And then in 2010, two important things happened. One. I became pregnant for the first time with my daughter. And two, I got a new manager who was the physical embodiment of every negative thought I had ever had about myself. 
she would come in and say things to me like, you're not pushing it hard enough. And she would say things like, you just need to work harder and longer hours. You need to be quicker. And she would say things like, I don't think you're, you're, I don't think this is the right job for you. And so my confidence went from being kind of on shaky ground to completely plummeting and the quality of my work went straight down as well. And I remember things got so bad, they got to the point where I actually asked for a demotion. I asked to go back to my individual contributor role and what that would be, what that would mean. And when the, when the word came out, and actually, hold on, I forgot to put this slide up, Google. All these people really seem to have it together and I still have no idea what's going on. <laughs> but when the word came back of what my salary would be, I realized there was no way that uh, a family of three, uh, my husband had already quit his job to take care of our, our daughter. Um, we couldn't survive in Silicon Valley on what that salary was. And I remember getting the news, I was in my car, it was the only private place I could find, and I just remember sobbing and taking a moment to just breathe and feel all the feelings that came. You know, the sadness, the helplessness, the rage. And when it came down to it, after I kept breathing, it was just like fear. And I was like, oh, oh, I'm afraid. It's so like all those intense feelings just gave way to just being afraid. And I was like, oh, I know how to be afraid. Like, it's just fear. And I remember just like kind of laughing and realizing I had a decision to make. I could either stay in my position as a people manager and try to figure it out, or I could leave and do I don't know what. Because at that point, I felt like I had no worth. I didn't feel like I was good at anything anymore. So I decided to stay. I was like, I am not a quitter. We are gonna figure this out. I gotta figure this out. And so I leaned on my personal and professional support. And I began to entertain the idea. I was like, gosh, for 35 years, I always thought I was a fraud. And that everything I viewed in my life, I viewed through the lens of I am a fraud. But hitting that rock bottom, helped me contemplate a different question, which is, what if I'm not a fraud? What if all the things that the people who know me and love me and, and see me, they're saying, gosh, you really beat yourself up. Do you know how good you are? Like, what if I start to believe that, even a little bit, just a tiny bit? And so, little by little, that's what I started to do. And every time I would take this little baby step towards, what if I'm not a fraud? <coughs> Suddenly, like, things started opening up and kind of magical things started happening. Each time I took that step. And things really got um, interesting because at one point I had a, a big meeting, there were about 40 people, and I was co-presenting with my colleague Janice. And Janice was just amazing. She had written books. She was somebody everybody loved and respected. She was just like, she, she was so articulate. I always grew up, my parents and my brother would say like, oh, you just speak your own language, right? You, 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 like, it's hard to follow you. So I was always kind of self-conscious about the way I came across to people. But Janice was so articulate and amazing. And I remember going into this meeting with her, and every time I would go into these meetings before, because we co-presented a lot, I would be thinking to myself while I'm talking, what, is Jan what would Janice think? What is Janice thinking? What is Janice thinking? What is she thinking? What is she thinking? I hope I can be like Janice. I hope I can be like Janice. That's usually what happens. And so that day, I was getting into that headspace. But something inside me, maybe because I had been kind of taking these little baby steps out of you are a fraud and into maybe I'm not, something reared up in me that just said, forget Janice. Although I didn't say forget was another F word. Um, are we all okay with that F word? Are you okay if I dropped some F bombs? Okay. Because I was like, fuck Janice. Fuck her. Fuck her. Just do you. And suffer the consequences later. 
You say what you need to say and suffer the consequences later. And so I did. I stepped into that meeting. And instead of like, what is Janice thinking? What is Janice thinking? I was just like, no, fuck Janice. I'm just going to speak. And so I did. And I got some pretty hard questions uh, from the group afterwards. And I answered them. And I was able to kind of like keep it, keep it together. And then, of course, <laughs> the meeting ends. And Janice is across the room. And she locks eyes with me. And she just beelines it to me. And inside, I am like, oh, no, what did I say? What did I say? And at this point, we had been working together for like five years. And she came up to me and said, I just want to tell you, I have never heard you talk like that before. And it was amazing. That was beautiful. I've never heard you talk about your work. I've heard you talk about your work a lot of times, but I've never heard you talk about it quite in that way. You got a lot of really hard questions, and you answered them beautifully. Well done. And then she walked away, and I just sat there and went, OK. Maybe I'm on to something. <laughs> and it turns out, two years later, after I've been a recovering imposter, I learned there was a name for all of this. Y'all knew the name before you even walked in, right? Imposter syndrome. So let's talk. Oh, first I want to tell you something. Um, oh, and I need to say, once I started trusting myself, Self-trust is the first secret of success. Once I started trusting myself, that is when the promotion started happening again. That's when the, um, the recognition started coming. That's when, I will tell you, my team did the best work ever happened after I started taking those steps. The quality of my work was good before, but it went so much higher once I was able to kind of take those baby steps into what if I'm not a fraud. And this is the key, trusting in yourself, trusting in your resiliency. It's interesting, Anil is here, um, and I was just talking to him last night, and it, we had this great conversation about fear. And one of the things that he said is that he uses fear as um, not necessarily something to stop, but it's not stop him, but something to harness, to propel yourself forward. Because when you're afraid of something, who knows what's on the other side? It could be your passion. It could be a positive step in, in a, new, a new habit, a new way of life. So we can harness our fears and propel us forward, or we can get stopped and shut ourselves down. And my hope for you is that you're able to make like a one degree shift, just a one degree shift to help you go from heading towards, uh, you know, self-critic island <laughs> to heading towards the country of confidence because there's so much great things around confidence. And if we can make that one degree shift then um, and sustain it over time, it can really take you to a great place. Oh, and because it's 4.30 in the afternoon, anybody a little tired or on overload? Yeah, okay. So let me tell you two things I like to tell people when I'm um, speaking. One is, and this is great for anyone who is really uh, critical for, of themselves. I have a mentor who said, um, instead of saying, you know, it's really easy to say things like, oh, I'm so, you make a mistake and you go, oh, I'm so stupid, right? Anybody say that to themselves? I'm so stupid? Yeah. So instead of saying that, he's like, what if you change that? Just say, I'm so sexy. <laughs> I'm so sexy. You make him say, oh, I'm so sexy. Right? It's, a, it's silly. It's silly. And if and uh, chances are, I'm going to be sexy today. So if I am, you feel free to tell me. I'm, I'm okay with that. The second thing um, that I love doing with groups, especially when um, energy is starting to become a schlump, is um, sometimes I just like for people to give each other a little high five, a little, like, get our physical bodies engaged, and I might ask you to do that. So, actually, I'm going to ask you right now. I want you to turn to someone, give them a high five, and say, I'm so sexy. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about sexiness and let's talk about imposter syndrome. I'm going to come down here because I like, I like this a lot. So, 
Imposter syndrome. Well, the thing about imposter syndrome is that imposter syndrome of impacts. Um, oh, I'm sexy right now. I'm going to be in two places at once. I can. <laughs> imposter syndrome affects high achieving people. It affects people who are highly skilled, but have a low a, a perception of themselves that they are actually lowly skilled. Right? Like that's their perception. So you actually maybe that's why it affects people in tech. It affects people, professors at universities. It affects people who um, are really high achieving, but inside, they feel like they're going to be found out as a fraud. They think, ah, it's just luck. Oh, I'm just, I'm just really nice and people like me. This was all just a fluke. It was just, you know, it just kind of happened that I got this amazing job. There are people who are at upper levels in um, executive teams in large companies who are thinking, I'm just here because it's a fluke. And when you ask, well, does your team just hire nice people? And they're like, no. No, they're really rigorous. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so we have a high ability, right? We have high ability. So our actual ability is quite high, but our perceived ability, our perception of our ability is quite low. This is different than the, um, oh, oh gosh, Dunning-Kruger effect. Anybody heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? Raise your hand if you've heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Dunning-Kruger effect is the opposite. Dunning-Kruger effect is when your actual ability is quite low but your perception of your ability is high. So I think about this like, when, you know, American Idol, when they would be like, uh, you know, are you gonna be the next American Idol? Oh, yes, I am, and, and they're all pumped up, and then they step up, and they're like, whoa. It's like, no, no. This is somebody who has a low ability, but their perception of themselves is quite escalated. And the biggest fear for most imposters is that they are really afraid of being the Dunning falling into that Dunning-Kruger effect, and so they do everything possible to keep their perception of themselves low. And I love this quote, so Dunning-Kruger effect, a wise man never knows all, only fools know everything. And imposter syndrome, Mike Myers, he, he did Austin Powers, Wayne's World, writer, director, comedian, at any time I still expect that no talent police will come and arrest me. That's what, that's what imposter syndrome sounds like. It sounds like somebody's gonna come at any point and take this away from me because it was all luck anyway. And the interesting thing is, oh, I'm coming down again. I've got one more sexy, sexy. So here's the thing. What we wanna do is we wanna bring this blue line up to this kind of gray area so that our perception of our abilities matches our actual abilities. And not only that, um, there's a great book called The Confidence Code, where they talk about how your confidence is more important than your IQ. It's more important than your actual ability. And what they find is that successful people actually have a slight tilt, just a slight tilt, toward overconfidence. So in reality, you're here, you're a high achiever. You want to be not here, you want to be just slightly above that line. And for many people, this is a, I mean, this is a stretch. It's a leap to go that high, especially when you're used to being down here. This is a, a perception problem, not a performance problem. That's what imposter syndrome is. It's not about your performance. It's about your perception around your performance. All right. Let's see here. Where are we at? Oh, good. I still have time. One other thing. And so what happens is when our confidence is so low, again, like, and another way to put this is this is a confidence issue, not a competence issue. Right? Your competence can be super high, but your confidence in yourself can be so low, and that impacts us in so many ways. For example, if, uh, if there's a job that you are interested in kind of excelling to, for most women, they will wait until they meet 100% of the criteria before they apply for that job. 
For men, typically, not all men, but men typically, 60%. So that means if people are, when they have higher confidence, they put themselves up for promotion sooner. They put themselves out there sooner. They're okay to make a mistake and fail in front of a group. For others, that's like the, the, the worst thing imaginable. And so they don't put themselves out there. And by the way, just for the, the, the data people here, 70% um, of the US population is impacted by imposter syndrome. And it impacts women, people of color, immigrants, people who grew up in lower socioeconomic status, LGBTQ, because it's really easy to confuse the messages that society gives us about their perception of our abilities, and that feeds into our, um, that, that can feed into our own perception of ourselves. It also impacts people who work from home. It impacts people in highly creative fields where there's a lot of learning that needs to happen. That's why it affects tech so much. Because there's a lot of unknowns, there's a lot of risks that need to be taken, there's a lot of creating that needs to happen. Okay? So, you know what? I, let's, take it, let's take a high five. This is a perception problem, not a performance problem. High five someone to tell them that. This is a perception problem. <laughs> Not a performance problem. This is one. This is perception. Let's do this. So now, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do about this? So one of the first things that we can do is to recognize your inner critic. And what I love doing for people, because I'm telling you, it is so powerful. Give your, give your inner critic a name. You know, when I sat there in that meeting, I was able to find the dial in which I was able to turn down, in my fuck Janice moment, I was able to turn down the volume on my inner critic and turn up the volume on my inner contender. My inner contender, in, in, the inner contender I define as that part of you that if they, you know, like, if they were not afraid, what would they do? It's a part of you that just wants to go for it, wants to say what needs to be said, wants to put out the content you want to put it out like, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? That's your inner contender, right? So it's helpful to name your inner critic or your inner, and your inner contender. So for example, I, um, one of the things I do is I do consultations with people. I gave a talk at Amazon uh, a couple months ago. So, uh, over 600 people uh, ended up attending the talk, and uh, one of I, I was having these consultations with a lot of people, and there was this one guy who was at a top-level executive team, uh, immigrant, uh, and he came from uh, he went to a university that wasn't as prestigious as his colleagues, and he said, "I'm so afraid of losing my seat at the table. I'm so afraid that I'm gonna I'm gonna get." You know, they're going to find me out. I think they just hired me. I think they just brought me out because they all liked me. So we were able to kind of like work that, that out. And I said, you know, what's, what's the name of your inner commander? Or your inner contender? And he's like, oh, this is so silly. He's like, it's the commander. And I was like, cool. All right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to build a swagger song list that helps you bring out your inner contender. So before you go into those meetings that make you really nervous, you've got your swagger song that you're listening to in the car so the commander can show up. Because the commander, you already have a seat at this table. You wanted this seat at the table, you have it. Don't lose it. Because when you, show, when you continue to show and you're kind of like still trying to be scrappy and prove that you earned your seat, people will see that. They're like, mm, I don't know, right? But when your inner contender can show up or your inner commander can show up, then it can make a difference. I checked in with him six weeks later. He's like, ah, Allison, I can't even tell you. I'm feeling so much better. I'm doing great work. I have, I have like a 
whole playlist that I listen to. And I don't really need it all the time, but there are some days that I do, and it's helped me so much. I'm feeling so much better about being on this team. It's like, cool. I have another uh, person, same thing, did a uh, consultation with her. She, uh, hers was called the cheerleader. She's a lawyer. And she oftentimes was the only woman in the room. And so people would come in and ask her to take notes. And instead of imploding, like most people do, she would explode towards the others and get really, um, you know, kind of blast other people. And she recognized it was a problem. She, she had a hard time um, trying to fix it. But again, it was that scrappy upbringing. She came from a lower socioeconomic class and um, didn't go to as prestigious of a school. And so she was still like that kid fighting for her worth on the streets. And she was able to, the cheerleader helped her be like, you know what, you're okay. You're totally okay. You don't need to blast those people. You're good. Everybody, the people who know you see that. And I checked in with her six weeks later and she's like, it's really helping me. Naming your inner critic and naming your inner contender can be tools to help you be able to find those volume tiles. My inner critic, I call the wagging finger. It is just like, you should know better, you're not enough, you're not good enough. It's like just a giant wagging finger. Other people, Cruella de Vil. Right? So let's, let's do this. We've got, we've got a little, uh, do we have time? Yeah, we do. Let's take 30 seconds. Write down, what's the name of your inner critic? Oftentimes the first thing that comes to mind. Write down your inner critic, write down your inner contender. And anybody got one that they feel brave enough? Yeah. My inner critic, I named my inner critic Steve a while ago. Steve he looks just like Steve Buscemi. He's a character played by Steve Buscemi. He's oh, Steve Buscemi. Steve Buscemi, yes. He gives me really bad advice. Like, you should just go back to bed and pull the cover over your head. I say, shut up, Steve. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Steve Buscemi, he's a, he has a great inner critic. I can just see him all kind of wiry and, yeah, strung out. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, one other thing I like to do, again, in, in my workshops, let's give, it, let's give this guy a whoosh from your heart. This is just like a thank you. It's like a positive energy. Ready? One, two, three, and whoosh. Yeah. Get a little wooey for you guys. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, my inner critic, uh, actually, I, I came up with this uh, inner critic like 10 years ago as just like a thing of why Internal Asian mom. Internal Asian mom. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, high standards, oh, yeah. highly critical. Uh huh. Yeah, excellent. Let's give, let's give a little whoosh here. One, two, three. And a whoosh. So the point is not to kill the inner critic. The inner critic's there to help keep you safe, emotionally safe, mentally safe, physically safe, sometimes. But the point is to turn down the volume, because the inner critic lies. The inner critic can crowd out every positive thing about yourself. The inner critic can make you believe that you have nothing of value. And that's why we, anybody have an inner contender? See, sometimes it's easier to name our inner critic than our inner contender. Yeah. I think a friend who just gave me some good advice a couple of years ago. He's kind of locked in there. Yeah, yeah. Does it, what's his name? Kevin. Kevin. Perfect. Excellent. Let's give a whoosh. And a whoosh. Excellent. Thank you. That's right. And sometimes it could be that. It could be somebody we know. Someone that, that helps us remember our value and our worth. Thank you. All right. So because our inner critic can wreak havoc on us, because our inner critic can kind of crowd out all of the things that we're good at, we have to do what we can to remember that our positive qualities. 
So, anybody ever receive a performance review and they scroll all the positive comments and then just go right to the areas of development? Raise your hand if you've done that. Or you get comments on your blog and everybody's like, wow, that's so amazing, oh my gosh, that's great. And then like one person says something negative and like that's the only thing you see. Right? It's just like hyper-focused on that one negative review and kind of disregard the rest. It's really easy for us to do that. And the problem becomes that when we hyper-focus on the negative, then we kind of crowd out all the things that we are good at. And it keeps that perception of ourselves really low. I used to, when I would give talks, I would look at, I would give talks to a room and I would see, you know, 50 people like leaning in and I would see one person kind of like checked out and I would speak only to that person. I would be like, you, I'm focusing right on you. I'm going to flip you. I'm going to turn you. You're going to love me, man. And it like, it never really helped. I was like ignoring all the other people that were like smiling and nodding along. And now I've learned that I don't, I don't need to pay attention to the checked out person. I need to lean into the people that are actually with me, the people that are actually hanging on with me. We need to lean into those positive comments because there's not just to inflate our ego, but to help remind us why we're here doing this work in the first place to help remind us of our worth, to not let our inner critic run, wreak havoc. So one thing that I actually encourage people to do sometimes is to make a brag list. Try it one day. Brag about yourself. Like unfiltered bragging. Every, the coolest thing that you have ever done in your entire life. I can make my tongue into it. A taco, you know, like you could, the most minuscule thing, I'm really good at making barnyard animal sounds, or I am an amazing writer, or I am an amazing coder, or I am an amazing whatever. We sometimes need to remind ourselves of that. Because it helps us be able to see all of ourselves and not lose track of ourselves. And it also helps propel us for those times when we are afraid. And we think, I can't put this out there. I can't have that hard conversation. It helps push us through that. <coughs> Make sense? So, this is just one of those interesting things in life where our comfort zone is here and the magic happens over outside of our comfort zone. We all kind of know this, right? And for those of you who are bloggers or who are creating content or have created your own business, um, we have a lot of practice in being outside our comfort zone. Yes, like we, we, we practice that on a daily basis. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I heard a talk earlier, Michelle, she uh, received a question from the audience where somebody said, what would you, if, if you were to go back in time to when you first started being a blogger, what, what do you wish you knew then that you know now? And she said, I wish I wasn't afraid. I wish I wasn't afraid to ask for help. This is when we are afraid, our inner critic is running amok. When we are not reaching out, our inner critic is usually running amok. So we have to interrupt the pattern. We have to interrupt that inner critic and say, Oh, I hear you. I hear you, Steve. I need Kevin to come in now. I hear you, um, internal Asian mom. And now I need whoever, to come back. I need somebody, so, like, I, I hear the fear. I hear it. And usually fear, anybody experience this where your fear, the thing you're most afraid of, once you actually do it, it leads you to that next level that you've been dying to get to in the first place? Raise your hand if you've had that happen. 
the thing you're most afraid of, then suddenly you do it, and then suddenly it's like, oh my gosh, this is what I've been wanting all along. Our fear is not necessarily something that should stop us in our track. It's kind of an indication that there's some gold on the other side. There's this great quote from Joseph Campbell. It says, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure that you seek. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure that you seek. That fear is just a feeling of like, you're about to change. You're about to grow in a big way. You're about to take that next step and, and go to that next level. That's why my best work happened after. You know what I mean? It's like after I was like, oh, I'm just afraid. Okay, I can work through fear. Let's move through this fear. Let's step into, let's step into all the things I am good at. Let's feel the fear. Let's do it anyway. And this isn't about fake it. You know, some people say, ah, oh, fake it till you make it. And that's, that's true to a certain extent. I'm not a big fan of faking things. I, I prefer to be just that, just me. Um, but what faking it does is faking it gives you that little oomph to like take the risk, to be a little bit more bold, to take that next step. And so uh, we, have to, we have to interrupt our fear patterns to help us take those next steps. Good. So, let's see here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so, I created a, a guide for people if you want more information. It's called um, Imposter Syndrome Survival Guide because um, I see what happens. I see um, how people will work themselves to the bone, especially the, uh, small business owners and um, entrepreneurs where you're just working all the time. It's like a working smarter, not harder kind of thing. Imposter syndrome will make you work harder all the time and it will stop you from working smarter. It'll stop you from taking care of yourself so that you can do the great work. Imposter syndrome, I see how much it stops people in their fears from actually growing their business, from making the calls or um, you know, writing the content that they really want to write, but then they are worried about what other people will think, those kinds of things. Um, I see that. I see, I have a front row seat of that because my clients are, most of them entrepreneurs, business owners, um, or executives. And I see them stopping themselves a lot. But I also see what happens when they break through. And I also see them growing their businesses a lot more. I see them getting more clients. I see them uh, having the hard conversations and then suddenly everything changes for the better because they did. And so um, if anyone is interested in that, um, I actually have one other thing. After you, if you, if you do the guide, um, there's an opportunity for a consultation with me and you can do it for free if you just type word into the consultation thing. So that I just want to offer that to you because it's important to me. I see all of the people in WordCamp as being um, really doing things to change the world in for a better place. And to me, that's uh, it's just important because um, I know magical things happen when people are stepping into their inner contender and not their inner critic. So, um, so that's a gift that I just want to offer. That being said, my hope for all of you is that you make whatever shift you can to interrupt the inner critic in you and step, help you step into the inner contender. You don't have to be exhausted, flattened um, people. You can do amazing work and also take care of yourself. You can do amazing work and dance with people's concerns and reflections of you. And my hope is that, is that you do that and you take whatever steps you need to take so that you can show up in the world in a big way. That's what I have in terms of content. Did any questions? feel very comfortable in portions of your life, but then feel like you're in total 
imposter with a very, a very specific skill set? Yeah, that's a great question. So, can you feel confident in others in real life, but then uh, suffer from imposter syndrome? It's it's interesting. Um, yes and no. I think for many people, imposter syndrome is kind of pervasive. I know for me, it was like I felt like a fraud with my husband, who I was about to marry. I felt like a fraud in applying to Google. Like it, it kind of was like if anyone really knew what was going on inside this head, they would not love me. Like that was that was like kind of one end of the of the spectrum, right? I think there's also sometimes imposter syndrome just kind of flares up. So like if you're if you're in a new job or you're taking, you're doing a, a whole new project that you don't, you're in the learning process. There's a really great book called um, uh, The Secrets of Highly Successful Women, Valerie Young. She talks about seven good reasons why you would feel like an imposter. And one of them is you're learning something new. A lot of college students feel it. Uh, it can also happen if, if, if the workplace environment is not conducive. Um, there are certain workplace environments where they're like, I want you to achieve great things, but have a really low risk. Like, take really low risk. That is like, that is just a pressure cooker of imposter syndrome. Like, it's a breeding grounds for that. Um, so, I think it can, it can happen, and, and part of it is to um, kind of tease out why. Why is it happening in this particular area? Is it because I'm learning new things? Is it because I'm having to show up in a bigger way? Um, is it because I'm having to have more difficult conversations? Is it because of the environment? Is it because I'm the only woman in the room, the only person of color in the room, the only whatever in the room? Like sometimes um, those are factors that can feed into it as well. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Yes. Let's see if I can. Yeah. It kind of works. I'll, I'll come over here. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I have classic exactly what you're talking about. Um, and one thing that helped me overcome it, I, I, I've always wanted to present at one of these conferences. Um, but I always thought, oh, I don't know anything. I don't know. I could. I can't. I can't uh, present about Node.js because I don't know Node.js. I can't present about React because I don't know React. I was, I, like time and again, I'd be like, I'd really like to present, but I don't know anything. And, that, but, but it, and this sounds kind of stupid, but at one point I thought, well, you know, why don't I present on something I actually know about? <laughs> 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 and I did, and it worked. It was, I mean, it was like, it was, a, it was, it, it was quite a leap for me to do, but I was like, you know, I actually do know something, and, and it went, you know, it was at the Pacific Northwest Drupal Summit last, yeah, sorry, it's Drupal, <laughs> last year, and it went really well, but, you know, it, was, and it, it took me years to finally, you know, decide that I did know something that was worth presenting about. So. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. And that is where, to me, that's where the brag list comes in. And the brag list doesn't have to be necessarily, I'm amazing. But it's like, what do I know? What do I know? Right. Because I'm not sitting, I'm working my butt off. I'm not sitting around eating bonbons, not doing anything, right? Like, I do know things. There, there is, everyone in this room knows things. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves of that. Um, because if you do have the goal of presenting, then you can you can find those things that you do know and talk about instead of shitting on yourself. You know, like when you're, well, you should know this or you should know that. Um, it's not always helpful when we shit on ourselves. Yeah. Any other questions? Or comments? Yeah. So, I feel like where the imposter syndrome shows up for me is when it comes, I'm a freelancer, when it comes time to write my invoices, I feel completely confident in my skills and my knowledge when I'm doing the work, uh -huh. and I know my clients love me, and then it comes time to like send them a bill, and there's this voice, Steve says, no one's gonna pay you for what you do. <laughs> They're gonna look at that bill and laugh. Yeah. 
So it's very small and it's possible to use it super specific. Any tips? Yeah, that's a, there's a lot that can be done around working with our relationship with money. Um, because it definitely, it definitely can show up in, those, in, in that arena because uh, money has a lot of meanings and a lot of attachments for us. And our relationship with money, it really impacts the way we ask for money. Um, and the way we value, we put a monetary value on ourselves. Um, and so it's worth, uh, I know for me, things that have been helpful is uh, really just reflecting on what, what does money mean? What were the messages that I received as a kid growing up around money? What are the things that I tell myself about money? How do I, you know, is money like there's not enough and there's never enough? Or is money um, something that is uh, you only get if you're good enough? Or is money, you know, there's, there's a lot of stories that we can make up about money. That, that uh, note to self, that's a, that's a good talk for a future thing. Um, because I think it, it flares up a lot for people. But if you remember why he hired you, at some point this person hired you. And you sold yourself. Sold your talent, sold your skills to him, and he chose you. Have that same conversation with yourself. Definitely, and I think there's also um, sometimes we need sounding boards in our lives, other people to say no. You should be charging this much, and for us to kind of like interrupt that pattern and just boldly like suffer the consequences. I'm just going to put this. Invoice out, and I will, I, I will suffer the consequences of whatever comes my way as a result. Usually, it's a check. <laughs> yeah, it's a check. And you're like, sweet. Take it to the bank. Yeah. Yes. I'll just make a comment. Um, I suspect I'm a little bit older than you, but I'm also female, and yes. I'm, what's really exciting is to see young people younger people than I am, learn about this stuff earlier in life, because it's the type of stuff uh, for many of us in my generation and um, older, that, it, you know, we, and I'm, a, my first profession is civil engineering, so I've been around in a man's world for much of my life, and, you know, it, it's so nice to have a name to put on this, um, and I am getting rid of, my, my inner critic is my mother, and it's like my real mother. <laughs> and, and, and she's not in this room, so I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but to, 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 to write that down and then cross it out and then go, well, maybe it really is. So I just use her name, Marge. So I'll check her name on it. But, but it's just that, it's just to realize, to be able to put a name on it. But it's kind of sad that it's also my mother. And I'm glad I didn't raise my kids that way at all. Yeah. Uh, but still, it's just, it's kind of a, it's, it's, uh, it's, so it's very exciting to hear something from the next generation that uh, is going to make things better for everyone. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. I didn't, know, like I said, I didn't know about imposter syndrome until two years, I was like two years out of the woods. And I went to a workshop at Google and they were like, we're going to talk about imposter syndrome. I'm like, are you kidding me? I've been suffering. Like, I finally got myself out of this. It would have been nice to have known there was like a new name. So, um, yeah, it is helpful. And there's a great book that um, Secrets to Successful Women is, I can't even emphasize that enough, by Valerie Young. It's a fantastic book and a great resource for, it's, I know it talks about women and, it, like I said, men um, suffer from it too, but uh, it's, it's, it's really eye-opening. I think I am at time. I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much.